Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for sharing with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I understand that uh, we are very fortunate to be able to share with uh, our uh, lecturer, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mercedes uh, Vasquez, um, this uh, um, subject, um, literature uh, taken into the cinema. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, a few words about Mario Vargas Llosa. He was uh, awarded with the Nobel Prize in 2011. And uh, when he received the prize, uh, he said that uh, he is the, the perfect product of uh, Peruvian society and that literature is an expression of this uh, Peruvian reality. It is our only Nobel Prize uh, laureate, uh, and uh, he's still alive. He is the only Nobel Prize alive uh, uh, from Latin America. And when he received the prize, he said it was not only it, it was not the prize to him, but to the Spanish language uh, that we share uh, all in, in in all Latin American countries. Uh, when uh, a couple of months ago we we were talking to to, to Mercedes. And she is doing in, in intensive research on movies, on Latin American movies. So we thought that she was the most uh, capable person in order to talk about Mario Vargas Llosa and how his uh, um, uh, books were taken to the, to, 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 to the movies. Um, cinematography, it is very entertaining. It is the uh, most entertaining of, 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 of all subjects in the, in the industry, right? And uh, that's another, that's another, another plus for uh, uh, organizing this conference. So now, uh, please uh, welcome Ms. Mercedes Vasquez. Thank you very much, um, uh, Consul General, for your kind words. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished guests of honor, members of the audience, and uh, dear readers. I would like to congratulate the Consul General of Peru and all the consuls present here today who have made a concerted effort to promote Latin American literature in Hong Kong. This is the outline of uh, today's talk. Latin America, a subcontinent of which it can be said what Vargas Llosa quoting Jose Maria Arguedas uh, re regarding Peru, which is uh, el país de todas las sangres, the country of all the bloods, and also like the Aleph of Borges, a little world in itself, has contributed enormously to world literature. Due to its complex history, which brought together European, African, native Latin American, uh, and Asian civilizations, Peru, for instance, has a very large Chinese population. Latin America is a region with a thriving political and cultural history in the past and in the present. Some of Latin American writers have been rewarded with Nobel Prizes in literature, such as the Mexican Octavio Paz in 1990, the Colombian Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who is the most well-known of all for his masterpiece, 100 Years of Solitude, uh, he was awarded the accolade in 1982, the Chilean Pablo Neruda in 1971, the Guatemalan Miguel Ángel Asturias in 1967, Carlos Fuentes and others. There is a number of great Latin American writers who, despite not having achieved this honor, are internationally regarded as highly influential authors. This is the case of Adolfo Bioy Casares and particularly his compatriots Julio Cortázar and Jorge Luis Borges, also from Argentina, uh, who serves even the, the prominent literary scholar uh, Harold Bloom to classify all short stories in the world into two types, the Chekhovian, a type based on the stories written by the Russian writer Anton Chekhov, and the Borgesian styles, a type based on Borges' stories. Such is the extent of the influence attributed to him in world literature. These are writers whose thematic interests, ranging from the most local and particular to the most abstract, never fail to appeal to a global audience. These writers have managed to create works which, despite be being deeply rooted in their Latin American reality, speak to any citizen of the world. And for this reason, we recommend their reading to the Hong Kong public and celebrate this initiative by the consulates of Hong Kong. In today's talk, I will attempt to introduce Mario Vargas Llosa as a renowned writer and a social leader, trying to be as unbiased as possible. And I will illustrate some of the characteristics of the prose of this Latin American writer, 
particularly in relationship to the film adaptations of some of his works, all with the aim of inviting readers to fully enjoy his novels, essays, and articles if you haven't done so yet. For the sake of time, the novels on which I will focus are The Time of the Hero, Captain Pantoja and the Special Service, and Julia and the Scriptwriter and the Feast of the Goat. Mario Vargas Llosa is a renowned writer and a social leader. Everybody knows that one of the major reasons why we are celebrating today Mario Vargas Llosa's works is the celebrity status he achieved with the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2010. But this was just the climax of a whole life that devoted to literature. He started to write when he was a child and directed his first play when he was barely 16 years old. His play, La Huida del Inca, had won him the second prize in a children's literary contest, and his school in Piura gave him the chance to put on a performance at Teatro Variedades. He's also an important essayist and journalist, something that characterizes a whole generation of writers for whom politics and culture were not as separated as, separated as they are today for many depoliticized contemporary writers. Vargas Llosa is an artist and intellectual interested not just in Latin America, but also in world affairs concerning other areas of the world, such as the Middle East or Eastern Europe. As a public figure, he's well known. He's a well-known political and social critic. And despite being classified as a public figure who looks for controversy by some, he claims that he's not a polemicist. But despite the international attention of his political views, he is definitely most well known internationally for his lengthy novels, such as The Time of the Hero, Conversation in a Cathedral, The Feast of the Goat, or The War at the End of the World, of the End of the World, which Harold Broom has included in his literary canon as one of the best novels ever written. He was born in Arequipa, uh, Peru, in 1936 in an upper-middle-class family whose members are represented and transfigured in his novels. Vargas Llosa draws extensively from his personal experiences to construct his stories. His mother separated from Vargas Llosa's violent father when the boy hadn't been born yet, and he was raised by his mother's large family of grandparents, uncles, aunties, and cousins, and spent his childhood between Cochabamba in Bolivia and Piura in Peru. After having been made to believe for 10 years that his father had died, uh, the father reappeared in his life to take him abruptly to the capital, Lima. This was a traumatic moment in his life that is visible in his fiction. As his father was very authoritarian and even violent, literature served as a refuge and an act of rebellion for the young Vargas Llosa. From, his biographical, from this biographical detail, we begin to understand why the Swedish Academy justified the award of the Nobel Prize to Vargas Llosa for his cartography of the structures of power and his trenchant images of the individual's resistance, revolt, and defeat. His father sent him to good private schools, but when he caught Vargas Llosa writing poetry, he told him that literature was for fagots and sent him to the tough military school Leoncio Prado in order to cure him and make him a man. There, he met students from all walks of life and social classes, and incidentally, social class differences are very significant in his works. At 16, while he was still attending this military school, he started to work as a journalist, and from then on, his discipline and tenacity made him one of the most prolific writers in Spanish. As a scholar Raymond Williams has noted, quote, Mario Vargas Llosa is the prodigy of the writers associated with the boom of Latin American literature. With the possible exception of Carlos Fuentes, he has also been the most prolific. By the mid-1970s, this disciplined Peruvian, at that time still not 40 years old, had published enough for three respectable lifetime careers. And adds, by 1966, at the age of 30, Vargas Llosa was already one of the most prominent writers in Latin America. The harsh experiences at the military school Leoncio Prado would prove to be a painful and yet enriching experience, which became the raw material for his first novel, entitled La Ciudad de los Perros, literally the city and the dogs, but translated in English as the time of the hero. This moral novel about the life of a group of cadets in a military school published in 1963 by the Spanish publisher Seix Barral 
the most important publisher of fiction in the Hispanic world, won him immediate recognition from critics and readers, but also the criticism of some Peruvian army generals who arguably burned numerous copies of uh, the book because of the novel's portrayal of the corruption inside the military institution, a recurrent theme in Mario Vargas' uh, Josa's fiction. At this time, Vargas Llosa benefits from the so-called Latin American boom of the 60s, a literary phenomenon whereby suddenly there seemed to be an explosion of exceptional Latin American writers who caught the attention of literary critics and artists worldwide. Up to the 60s, Latin American writers had traditionally looked up to European and American artists in search for innovative literary movements and techniques. The 60s were the time to partly reverse the flow of this interest. In fact, a large number of talented Latin American writers had started to write and publish impressive works before the 60s, but in the 60s there was a successful marketing and publishing phenomenon that took advantage of the literary talent that was being nurtured for decades since the publication of books like the 1949's The Kingdom of This World by the Cuban Alejo Carpentier, in whose prologue appears for the first time Lo Real Maravilloso, or Magical Realism, a term that has served to praise, but also stereotype, Latin American literature. Although some of the members of this group had been actively publishing innovative novels since the 40s and 50s, it was the 60s when the works of, of Latin American talented writers would become uh, models for others to follow, and the, pub the publication of Vargas Llosa's works by Spanish publishers made him known. He is indebted to the Spanish publishers who afforded uh, him this opportunity, and incidentally, he possesses double nationality, Peruvian and Spanish, because he was given the Spanish nationality based on his literary merit. He was, uh, when he was only 18 years old, he felt passionately in love with his aunt Julia, the sister of his uncle's wife, and married her illegally against his father's and his entire family's will. Because uh, he was still a minor, um, uh, the legal age to marry in Peru at the time was 21, and his aunt was a divorcee around 15 years older than him. His father sent Aunt Julia to Chile, but they would later reunite and live in Paris until they divorced, and Vargas Llosa married another family member, his cousin Patricia Llosa with whom he has spent the rest of his life until now, and to whom he dedicated an emotional moment during his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. As his experience at the Military Academy, the episode of, of his life with Aunt Julia would become a successful novel published in 1977 with the title Aunt Julia and the Scriptwriter, in Spanish, La Tía Julia y el Escribidor, where a humorous tone replaces the somber tone of the time of the hero and continues a humorous vein initiated with an earlier novel published uh, five years earlier entitled Captain Pantoja and the Special Service. Vargas Llosa has studied and lectured in prestigious universities around the globe and has lived in cities like Paris, Barcelona, London, New York, and more uh, recently Madrid, although he spent some months in Peru every year with his extended family because, despite having become a citizen of the world, Peru and the Peruvian people generally provide him with the inspiration and the passion that are necessary to write. Regarding his political views, he has always been outspoken and interested in politics, as shows his candidature for the Peruvian presidency, which he lost to Alberto Fujimori in 1990. After a temporary infatuation with socialism in the 50s, a time when Latin America was plagued by military dictatorships, and the Cuban Revolution of 1959 seemed to him like a popular revolution able to combine communism with freedom, the 60s are a time of political disenchantment and gradual turn into the staunch defen defender of a liberal democratic socio-political model that he is today. Vargas Llosa has been characterized as a defender of neoliberalism, a term that refers to the advanced stage of capitalism that has been unfolding since the collapse of the Soviet Union and even earlier, and is characterized by the shrinking of the state, the relative control of national governments by supranational technocratic and US-based institutions such as the World Bank, the WTO, and the IMF, and the spread of global capitalism. 
Basically, Vargas is against the strengthening of the state, against the nationalization of services and commodities, and his major political principles are the defense of a democratic electoral system and the right of the people to choose their destiny, in his own words. Although these principles seem fairly reasonable, once they are put in a socio-political conjuncture in which major Latin American nations are governed by democratically elected left-wing uh, presidents, such are the cases of Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, among others. And the Latin American socio-political arena of the last 15 years has been characterized by what is often termed the pink tide or turn to the left in Latin America. His defense of freedom and opposition to the estatization of services acquire a new significance. He has, in fact, shown a strong opposition and even disrespect to current political and economic developments led by governments in countries like some of the ones mentioned above and others, like the Mexican government. When he was invited to Mexico by Octavio Paz in 1990, he publicly called the democratic elected government of Carlos Salinas de Gortari the perfect dictatorship, an opinion that caused a lot of controversy. Aware of the acceptance and support for left-wing movements by artists, intellectuals, and scholars outside Latin America, in his essay, Sueño y Realidad de América Latina, Dream and Reality of Latin America, published in 2010, he denounces the projection of European and American utopian desires and fantasies on Latin America. According to the writer, figures and processes such as Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution, uh, or Comandante Marcos and the Zapatista Rebellion, would be rejected in Europe by the same intellectuals who defend them when they exist in Latin America. His controversial remarks and a strong opposition to socialism and measures interpreted as a left-wing policies have won him criticism, but also the support of conservative sectors of the world population, such as the political opposition in Venezuela and the conservative political leader and former Spanish president, Jose Maria Aznar, who awarded him with a prize, uh, with a prize for the defense of freedom called El Premio Fais de la Libertad in 2012. Regardless of whether we agree or disagree with his political views, there is no doubt that he is an intellectual and artist that stands uh, against dictatorships of any kind, right and left, and that his involvement in world affairs speaks of his sincere conviction of the need for the intellectual to socially commit to the improvement of society through words and action. For the Hong Kong reader, Vargas Llosa can be an excellent open window to the polarized world of Latin American politics, particularly at a time when China is increasingly involved in the subcontinent. And now I turn to the, uh, the film adaptations of his novels. After this contextualization, we turn to the novels and their film adaptations. Eight of his novels have been adapted to the film medium inside and outside of Peru. There are in, they are in chronological order, Dia de Domingo, directed by Luis Llosa in 1970 and based on one of the stories of the collection Los Jefes, The Leaders, uh, written between 1953 and 1957. Uh, Los Cachorros, The Cubs, directed in 1973 by the Mexican Jorge Fons. Vargas Llosa thinks that The Cubs, shot by the talented Mexican director Jorge Fons, is not a good film. A first and failed attempt by the novelist himself at filming Captain Pantoja and the Special Service in 1975. La Ciudad y los Perros, uh, The City and the Dogs by Francisco Lombardi uh, uh, in 1985. Francisco Lombardi is the best well known internationally uh, uh, Peruvian filmmaker. Vargas Llosa likes this adaptation produced uh, by him and according to the writer, uh, this adaptation, uh, made with very little money, by the way, manages to capture the spirit of the novel. El Jaguar, Jaguar, in 1986, directed by the Chilean Sebastián Alarcón. Tune in Tomorrow, by the American John Amiel, made in 1990. A successful adaptation of Captain Pantoja and the Special Service by the Peruvian Francisco Lombardi, in 1999. Lombardi's adaptation of this light novel surprised uh, Vargas Llosa because it is much colder and tragic than the original written text, a farcical, uh, comical novel, but he still admires uh, Lombardi's work. And uh, the 205 adaptation of La Fiesta del Chivo, The Feast of the Goat, a co-production of the Dominican Republic, Spain, and the UK, directed by the novelist's cousin, 
Luis Llosa. In what follows, I will focus on four of them, but first, it must be noted that the first detail that perhaps calls the reader's attention uh, when we read uh, Vargas Llosa's novels is the abundance, the abundance of explicit references to cinema in his novels. Cinema theaters are oftentimes the privileged locations for the beginning of a relationship, as uh, happens in Anne Julian, the scriptwriter, or the time of the hero, uh, for instance. Uh, furthermore, in an interview about cinema conducted during the 12th uh, Film Festival of Lima a few years ago, Vargas Llosa described himself as a cinephile, a person who loves watching movies. Interestingly, his preferred film genres like uh, the Western or the film noir do not correlate with his preferred literary genres. Uh, the detective novel, for instance, does not interest him much. Beyond explicit references to cinemas mentioned above, the writer himself acknowledges that the treatment of time and space in cinema has highly influenced his writing, and he expresses his admiration for auteurs such as uh, Luis Buñuel, Orson Welles, Visconti, Berman, Ford, who have managed to create their own world and personal style despite the constraints of the film industry which are much higher than the limitations of the writer. He admires the capacity of cinema to treat time as a space which can be easily traveled forward and backwards. He claims that cinema's influence on literature is particularly noticeable in the freedom and flexibility to treat time and space that appeared in literature after cinema, as well in the increase of visuality in literature after that time. According to the author, Cinema has highly influenced his own narratives, not in the use of, of words, but in the structure and the use of point of view, uh, of perspective. Uh, for him, cinema makes very visible these techniques. Um, Karolina Sidnitsky explains this influence uh, uh, in the following terms. Vargas Llosa's narrative fiction, from his first novel through to his last, features cinematic techniques and themes. And his formal experimentation with the spatial and temporal planes, flashbacks and cuts, draws significantly on cinematic montage, as well as an awareness of effective camera angles to suggest a particular point of view. By cinematic montage, uh, here the scholar is referring to the film technique consisting in the combination of seemingly unrelated images without a clear logic that was invented and popularized by the Soviet filmmakers in the 1920s. Filmmakers around the world started to use this technique after them. One of them was the famous Spanish filmmaker Luis Buñuel, who confesses in his memoirs that he decided to become a filmmaker after watching the battleship Potemkin by the Russian Sergei Enstein. In 1929, Buñuel himself released the first successful surrealist movie called Anshan Andalou, where he uses this technique extensively. Something similar can be uh, thought of uh, Vargas Llosa's narrative. Despite their faithful representation of the plot and characterization created in the written texts, the four film adaptations by Lombardi, Llosa, and Emil do not manage to fully capture the formal complexity and experimentation that provide depth and suspense to Vargas Llosa's text. Regardless of the novel's tone, tragic or comical, Vargas Llosa's prose always engages the readers from the first page uh, and compels them to continue reading until the 500th uh, page and last page because the reader needs to actively participate in the construction of the story by making sense of a puzzle presented to him or to her uh, and also because the information uh, provided by the novelist is very fragmented. Little of this formal experimentation and suspense are retained in the movies, which following a typical Hollywood narrative mainly invite viewers to sit and relax or pasar un buen rato in Spanish, when compared to the demanding reading experience that the writer proposes. In addition to this, Karolina Sidnitsky has noted that the cinematic adaptations of uh, Vargas Llosa's novels are far from simple filmic replicas. Although they tend to follow the basic plot lines of the novels, they also tend not to share the ideological underpinnings that informed the original works. 
I will try to illustrate these claims in what follows. Um, the City and the Dogs uh, it was the film directed by Lombardi in 1985 based on the time of the hero. This is, uh, according to José Miguel Oviedo, uh, the novel most concretely based in Peruvian reality, according to Raymond Williams, and critics, uh, um, well, quoted in Raymond Williams, and critics have described it as a microcosm of Peruvian reality. The story unfolds as follows. The action that places the novel in movement um, is the theft of a chemistry examination by Cava, a student in the Leoncio Prado Military School. Unable to identify the culprit of this robbery, the school authorities confine all the cadets to the barracks indefinitely. After suffering confinement for several weeks, and consequently unable to visit his girlfriend on the weekend, one of the cadets, nicknamed Slave, Ricardo Arana, reveals the thief's identity to the school officials in exchange for the right to leave the premises. The school subsequently expels Cava. Jaguar, the aggressive leader of the youths in the school, along with his peers, suspects that someone has betrayed them. Soon thereafter, a slave is shot during some military maneuvers. Even though Jaguar appears to be guilty of the crime, the school officials conclude that the death is accidental, caused by a slave's own rifle. A slave's only friend, Alberto, the poet, is aware of the animosity Jaguar held toward the slave and tells the officials of the murder. Those in the upper echelon of the school hierarchy prefer to conceal the scandal that would inevitably follow a revelation of the facts. Alberto had written pornographic stories to sell to his peers. The school officials used their knowledge of this to blackmail him into silence. The one officer who seemed morally capable of questioning the situation, Gamboa, finds his career prospects ruined when he's sent to an isolated post in the provinces. Sidnitsky has pointed out that, quote, the influence of cinema in Vargas Llosa's prose can be appreciated in the way his narrative visualizes what a character sees, akin to cinematic points of view. For instance, in one of the most intense moments of the time of the hero, La Ciudad y los Perros, Alberto Fernández, the poet, the alter ego of Vargas Llosa himself and central voice of the novel, voices the accusation to Lieutenant uh, Gamboa that Jaguar has murdered Ricardo Arana, the cadet bullied by the others and called the slave. The techniques Vargas Llosa employs of focusing and framing and zooming in and out lend themselves to the easy translation of these sequences into a, in a screenplay. I, I'm, I'm going to read uh, the passage, the original passage from the novel that uh, Sidnitsky is, re is uh, referring to. It was an old two-story house with balconies over a flowerless garden. A narrow walk led from the rusting gate to the front door. It was an ancient door carved with dim designs that looked like hieroglyphics. Alberto rapped with his knuckles. He waited a few seconds, noticed the doorbell, pressed his finger on the button and quickly released it. He heard footsteps and came to attention. Come in, Gamboa said, stepping aside. Alberto entered and heard the door close behind him. The lieutenant passed him and walked down a long, dark hallway. Alberto followed him on tiptoe. His face was almost touching Gamboa's shoulders, and if the lieutenant had stopped suddenly, he would have bumped into him. But the lieutenant did not stop until he reached the end of the hallway and opened the door. Alberto waited on the threshold until Gamboa turned on the lights. It was a living room with green walls, and there were pictures in gilt frames. A man gazed fixedly at Alberto from the tabletop. It was an old, yellow photograph, and the man sported side whiskers, a patriarchal beard, and a pointed mustache. Sit down, Gamboa said, nodding towards uh, an armchair. Alberto sat down, 
and he felt himself sink into it as into a dream. Then he remembered he was still wearing his cap. He snatched it off, excusing himself in a low voice, but the lieutenant was closing the door and did not hear him. He turned, sat down in front of Alberto on a chair with ornate legs and said, Alberto Fernandez from the first section. Yes, sir. He leaned forward a little and the springs in the armchair creaked. All right, Gamboa said. What's this all about? Alberto looked at the floor. The carpet had a blue and cream color designed, uh, one square with another. Ah, sorry. Sure, yeah. Sorry. Um, Alberto looked at the floor. The carpet had a blue and cream color design, one square within another within another. He counted the bands, 12, with a gray square in the center. He raised his eyes. There was a cabinet against the wall behind the lieutenant. It had a marble top and the drawer pools were metal. I'm waiting, cadet, Gamboa said. Alberto looked at the carpet again. The death of Cadet Arana wasn't an accident, he said. They killed him. It was revenge, Lieutenant. As we read this passage, we can visualize the situation in cinematic terms. First, we imagine a static long shot of the facade of Lieutenant Gamboa's house. This is followed by a zoom in to the door and an extreme close-up or a close-up of the hand knocking at the door. Then there would be a cut to Alberto's face a tracking shot when Alberto is following Gamboa along the corridor with perhaps a handheld uh, subjective camera from the point of view of Alberto's eyes or above his shoulder. There would be a sudden change of light and a panoramic view of the living room. Then, as Alberto hesitates to inform Gamboa and is also curious about Gamboa's home, there would be close-ups of family portraits and the pattern rag to end in a shot, reverse shot, uh, typically used in, in dialogues. Now we are going to watch a clip from the movie to see how the director Francisco Lombardi and his cinematographer, uh, Billy Flores Guerra, resolve this scene. Teniente Gamboa. Buenos días, me tienen suficientes. Bueno, cadete, quería decirme algo muy importante, tan importante que tenía que venir a mi casa. Bien, lo escucho. ¿Qué pasa, cadete? Estoy esperando. La muerte de cadete Arana no fue casual. Lo mató el jaguar para vengarse. ¿Cómo dice? Lo han asesinado. Nunca perdonan a los soplones, se vengaron y lo mataron. Un momento. ¿Quiere usted decir que un cadete del colegio disparó deliberadamente contra Arana? ¿Eso es lo que quiere decir? Sí, mi teniente. En realidad todo fue por la consigna, por lo del vidrio. El esclavo no aguantó la consigna, estaba desesperado por salir. ¿Se acuerda que usted lo consignó antes por soplarme en el examen? A ver, cálmese. Vaya por partes sin orden. Él estaba enamorado, mi teniente. Le gustaba una chica. El esclavo no tenía amigos, no, no se juntaba con nadie. Se pasó casi los tres años de colegio solo, sin hablar con nadie. Todos lo batían. Lo... As we can see, mm. as we can see, um, the filmmaker and his uh, cinematographer do not draw the attention of the viewer towards the significant setting uh, which situates Gamboa in a middle class environment and go straight forward to the dialogue. In the novel, there is also a very interesting uh, interior monologue of the protagonist, Alberto, which due to the different nature of the film and literary uh, media is lost here. Although it must be said that Lombardi resolves this smartly by having Alberto wander uh, around the streets of um, Lima. As we watch him, we, the audience, imagine what he's thinking and perhaps uh, put ourselves uh, in his situation. 
Besides this, it should be noted that reading the novel, The Time of the Hero, is a, quote, a challenging intellectual experience, according to uh, Williams, due to the intricate, intricate pattern of plot development and the use of different temporal and spatial planes. The different narrators, the voices who tell the story in the novel are not always easy to identify, a characteristic that demands the contribution of the reader and produces suspense. The three narrators are also characters in the novel, Alberto, Boa, and Jaguar. Just looking at the, the first uh, two sentences from a one and a half passage uh, long of a narrative section of Alberto, the poet, one of the narrators, uh, when he's referring to his father, uh, we can observe the complexity of Vargas Llosa's perspectives. Um, in, this, in this passage, the word uh, solace refers to the Peruvian currency, for those who don't know it. I could go and tell him, I've got to have 20 soles, but I know what would happen. He would get all weepy and he would give me 40 or 50, but that would be just like telling him, I forgive you for what you've done to my mother and you can keep on whoring around all you want as long as you give me good bribes. Alberto's lips were moving silently under the wool muffler his mother had given him a few months before. In these two sentences, we can observe three types of discourse. One which is thought, the interior monologue of Alberto. A second one which is spoken, the indirect monologue. And one written and literary that corresponds to the narration of an omniscient narrator that is outside the story. As was said, in my opinion, this complexity is lost in Lombardi's rendition of the novel. Most of the film oscillates between what would correspond to an omniscient narrator and Alberto. Jaguar, an important counterpoint of Alberto in the novel, uh, by the way, be belonging to a very, uh, you know, to the lumpen proletariat, very low social class, is mostly shown to us in the film from Alberto's point of view but not in the novel where he has his own point of view. The simplification of narrators in the film makes the film easier to follow and understand by the viewers, but offers the audience less opportunities to collaborate in the contribution of the story. On another level, the lighting and color are two of the best achievements of this film with the changes in light signifying oppression or freedom from the superiors and the use of a gamut of gray tones to portray the mild but oppressive weather of Lima, uh, which are very effective. To conclude, regarding the ideological transformation between the novel and the film that uh, Sidnitsky has studied, she notes that Lombardi has uh, a more apocalyptic and pessimistic view of Peru than Vargas Llosa had during his socialist period. And I turn now to uh, Captain Pantoja and the Special Service, or Pantaleón y las Visitadoras. Concurrent with his 1970s uh, shift in political views from socialist to liberal democratic, Vargas Llosa's narrative was changing towards more accessibility and the experimentation with comedies. As a result, he published Captain Pantoja and the Special Service in 1973, and Aunt Julie and the Scriptwriter in 1977. Most of Mario Vargas Llosa's uh, novels are about 400 or 500 pages long, and one of his stylistic characteristics is the interruption of narratives and intermingling of different stories without any previous announcement, apart from the use of a blank space, which indicates that a new chapter is starting, or the use of capital letters at the beginning of a paragraph which, or section, which functions as a sign of change in narrative point of view. And these, these novels are no exception despite being lighter. Uh, let us watch the beginning of the movie uh, before summarizing the plot.
¿Estás seguro de que este es el hombre que estamos buscando? El servicio de inteligencia ha investigado absolutamente todo sobre su vida, tanto privada como profesional. Ingresó a la escuela militar de Chorrillos con el primer puesto. Eligió el arma de intendencia. Las mejores notas en matemáticas, economía y administración. Por lo cual tuvo el honor durante los cuatro años de estudios de izar la bandera el día de la clausura de fin de año. Hasta ahora, ocho años después de su graduación, ningún cadete ha logrado alcanzar su promedio ponderado. Prefiere el deporte y el estudio a las fiestas y diversiones. Pero tampoco escapa a la vida social. Asistió a la fiesta de su promoción con Alfonsina Reaño, con quien luego de tres años de noviazgo contrajo matrimonio. Se trata de una muchacha decente, seria, buena ama de casa y buena esposa. Uy, qué lindo está esto. ¿A dónde crees que nos manden esta vez, Pantita? Yo estoy rogando porque nos dejan en Lima. ¿Y tú? No, a mí me da igual. Cualquier sitio del Perú donde hay un cuartel es bueno para mí. Sí, tú y tu vocación. Tú estás casado primero con el ejército y después conmigo. ¿A dónde te gustaría que nos manden? Aparte de Lima, ¿no? Mm, a Chiclay otra vez. A Tacna o Piura. ¿No te interesa ninguna ciudad de la sierra? ¿O de la selva? Es una posibilidad. Mm, mm, odio la sierra. La selva y Quitos podría ser. La cosa es que sea una ciudad y no un campamento o una guarnición, pues panta. Tienes que pensar en el cadetito, porque ya puedo soñar con empezar a encargarlo, ¿no? ¿Ahora? ¿Puede ser? O en la noche, no importa que no sea sábado. En este momento estoy como cinco minutos retrasado, Pochita, y según mis cálculos, lo que demora ir de aquí al ministerio es como 30 minutos, y sin considerar inconvenientes de tráfico. Está bien. Bueno, vamos a tomar desayuno, mi capitán. Buenos días, señorita. Soy el capitán Pantoja. Tengo una cita con el general Collazos. Sí, capitán. Lo está esperando con el coronel López. Felicitaciones por el nuevo fideo. Gracias, mi coronel. Y por la manera tan brillante en que lo ha logrado. Gracias, mi coronel. Me informaron de su ascenso. Sacó el primer puesto a la primera y por unanimidad del jurado, por si fuera poco. Felicitaciones, capitán. Gracias, mi general. <coughs> siéntese, siéntese. ¿Cigarrito? No, gracias. Ya ve, mi general, ni fumador, ni borrachín, ni ojo vivo. Un oficial sin vicios. Ya tenemos quien represente a nuestro glorioso ejército en el paraíso junto a San Martín y Santa Rosa de Lima. ¿Ah? <risa> Tampoco hay que exagerar. Algunos vicios tendré que, que ustedes no conocen. Conocemos todo de usted, capitán. Se quedaría visco si supiera las horas que hemos dedicado a estudiar su vida. Bueno, al toro por las astas. El asunto que aquí nos reúne requiere la más absoluta reserva. Me refiero a la misión que se le va a encomendar. Se trata de lo siguiente, Pantoja. De un tiempo a esta parte, la tropa de la selva está... alborotada. Cuando nos informaron del problema, pensamos que se trataba de hechos aislados y manejables, productos del exuberante clima o el tipo de alimentación de la zona. Pero no fue así. Las cosas han ido de menos a más. El general es cabino, pero sobre todo el padre Beltrán, que dicho sea de paso ya me tiene hinchada las pelotas con sus partes diarios exigiendo que corrijamos la situación. Han tomado algunas medidas. Pero hasta ahora ni castigos ni escarmientos han logrado solucionar el problema. Por eso nos hemos visto en la necesidad de tomar medidas más radicales. Y es acá donde usted entra a tallar, Pantoja. Estoy un poco confundido, mi general. La verdad es que... Usted se va a hacer cargo de algo muy importante. El general Escabino le va a informar los detalles de la misión en cuanto se encuentre en el lugar de los hechos. Parte el próximo lunes, Pantoja. Espero que le guste la selva. Desde ya cuenta con toda mi confianza y apoyo para esta difícil y delicada misión. Le deseo la mejor de la suerte, Pantoja. Y recuerde, el prestigio de nuestra institución está en sus manos. Igual a Dalí de la Amazonía toda... Me siento obligado a levantar la voz en defensa de las mujeres de nuestra región. No soy un antipatriota, no. Pero mi amor por el ejército no me impide decir la verdad. Esta ola de violaciones que azota nuestro territorio, aterrando y mancillando el honor de nuestras bellas mujeres, tiene un... This is again a uh, story based on a real event. Um but transfigured into a credible and entertaining story. The plot revolves around a special mission given to Captain Pantoja by his superiors, uh, his superiors in the army, as we have seen. As Pantoja is briefed uh, by them, there is a problem uh, with the Peruvian soldiers deployed in the jungle of Iquitos because there are no brothels there. That is the secret mission. And men, the men cannot satisfy their sexual needs. 
As a consequence, they are starting to rape the women living in the area or entering into undesirable uh, sexual acts among cadets and even with animals, which are causing a lot of trouble for the army. To avoid a further escalation of the problem, some generals decide to send prostitutes uh, to the jungle. And here is where Captain Pantoja um, comes. No? As Lieutenant Pantoja has just been promoted to captain for obtaining excellent grades in the latest exams and has a clean record, his superiors assign him the secret mission of hiring professional sex workers for the military barracks. This is a sensitive operation that can cause embarrassment for the army if it is discovered, as the use of prostitutes is seen as immoral, in addition to the difficulty of justifying the use of public funding for such a service. It is hilarious the fact that Captain Pantoja is married to a young and innocent woman who loves him dearly and is a serious and trustworthy husband who never solicits prostitutes, therefore finding himself in a difficult moral conflict a dilemma between duty and his own moral convictions. To make his life even more difficult, he cannot disclose the details of this secret operation to his wife and his mother, who move with him to the jungle and who will find out the truth by themselves. When Pantoja finally sinks in the dark world that he has contributed to create and problems arise, his superiors, as it often happens in Vargas Llosa's novels, will not be there to bear the responsibility for the failure of this embarrassing operation. Summarized like this, the plot seems fairly simple and easy to follow. But when we open the first page, uh, pages of the novel, we start to realize that we, as readers, have to contribute our part with our own reading and critical thinking skills in order to follow the multiple narrative lines and enjoy the story. Um, well, I just, um, here I put uh, some of the dialogues that are uh, uh, interspersed in the first pages. Uh, it's a dialogue between um, Captain Pantoja and his wife before the meeting with the generals. Then there are also interventions. There is a voice of a religious fanatic, the brother Francisco, mixed with this dialogue. Uh, there is another dialogue between Pantoja and the generals, the one that we have seen uh, in the movie. There is also a mysterious voice by a radio host, uh, El Sinchi, which you have seen at the end of the clip that I have shown. Um, there are also, mixed with all these uh, other conversations, there are dialogues between the army generals in the jungle and people who are complaining because they are victims of rape. And uh, there is another dialogue with, uh, between Pantoja and his wife that happens after the meeting with the generals. And all this is mixed uh, in the first pages of the novel. So if you thought that this was going to be an uh, easy novel to read because it was lighter and humorous, perhaps uh, you have to think twice. No? In addition to interweaving stories and dialogues and changing narrators, Vargas Llosa skillful, uh, skillfully uh, incorporates distinct sources and media in a montage-like fashion. The inclusion of uh, newspaper clippings, radio shows, the recollection of dreams, letters, reports, and so on, allows readers to envision important aspects of his narrative in filmic terms as moving images. In the film version, we note, that, uh, we note Lombardi's aim of retaining these structural and stylistic features from the novel, but the result is more conventional than the novel. This entertaining film won nevertheless awards, such as the Audience Award at the International Festival of Viña del Mar in 2000, and was nominated for the Goya Awards, the Spanish Oscars, for the prize to the best foreign film in Spanish, in addition to enjoying considerable box office success. As regards the tone of the film, Lombardi was not interested in maintaining the comic or farcical character of the original novel. Um, I quote from Sidnitsky, in Lombardi's view, Pantoja is a character trapped in a world of obligations, responsibilities, and prejudices. His obsessive desire to carry out his duties has serious rather than humorous consequences. And I'll uh, move on to uh, another uh, of his uh, the film adaptations, and Julian, the scriptwriter, um, which in film became Tune in Tomorrow. This, uh, the novel, and Julian, the scriptwriter, is about a young writer 
who struggles to write while he's working at Radio Panamericana, a radio station owned by the Genaro family and characterized by regularly broadcasting news and intellectual programs as well as the latest musical hits from New York and Europe. This station stands in opposition to the other major radio station in Lima, where the novel is set, Radio Central. In contrast to Radio Panamericana, in Radio Central, also owned by the Genaro family, the programmers pander to the popular tastes of the population by using a slang and broadcasting popular Andean music, sometimes performed by extremely popular Indian singers. Um, in addition to these Indian singers, Radio uh, Central broadcasts programs such as melodramatic and sensationalist radio serials. Although our young protagonist of 18 years, called Mario, like the writer, works at the classy and intellectual Radio Panamericana, he frequently visits Radio Central. Most of the novel is set in the 1940s, 50s Lima, the capital of Peru, as I said, the dictator, General Manuel Arturo Odria Amoretti, took power in 1948 by launching a coup d'etat against the democratically elected president and governed the country until 1956 in the so-called Ochenio. Although the novel is extremely well documented in the real life of Peru, and Lima in particular, and contains many details which Limeños, inhabitants of Lima, would easily recognize, the precise political context is only incidentally mentioned towards the end of the story when a character says that the frequent racist remarks of the serials against Argentinians are unlikely to get the station in trouble because the general likes the serials. Later, the father of the protagonist of the novel is linked uh, also to the general's regime, so this is how we know that the novel is set in this historical period. The time span of the story then um, lasts from there until the 60s or 70s when Cuba has already become the state that is today after the revolution of 1959, something that is also very, very briefly uh, mentioned. These historical details are all in the background but hardly ever mentioned as Vargas Llosa concentrates on the daily life of two writers. One is the protagonist, Mario, and the other, a successful radio serial script writer coming from Bolivia called Pedro Camacho. Up to the moment when the script, uh, Pedro, uh, the script writer Pedro Camacho arrives at Radio Central, the owners of the station used to buy their scripts from the Cuban company CMQ, but hiring Pedro Camacho proves to be a great move. Pedro Camacho is a very popular, particular script writer who dignifies the radio teatros, the radio serials, entirely devoted to his job and is therefore the object of attention of the budding writer that is Mario. Pedro Camacho lives a very frugal life, it's little, rejects uh, social contacts, contacts, and uh, our protagonist Mario is the only person allowed to talk to him in the very few moments that he rests. He is, uh, Pedro Camacho is extremely prolific and boosts the audience ratings of the station. The Genaro family are very happy, uh, although Pedro Camacho is not exempt from controversy because he's always attacking the Argentinians. Uh, the irrational disgust that Pedro feels for them is one of his uh, eccentric features, which is in, in the movie this is changed, uh, the Argentinians are changed into Albanians, but this is kept in the movie. Despite the type of texts that he produces, melodramatic stories of incestuous love between brothers and sisters, rape and religious fanaticism, he embodies the artist. He feels a total devotion uh, to his job and identification with the characters that he creates to the point that he dresses like them in his private life. His job ethics uh, earn him the respect of the actors working for the serial who feel dignified by him. Pedro Camacho demands total concentration from his uh, actors, allows no interruptions, and acts as if he would be, as if we would be witnessing the shooting of a very prestigious film. There is in the novel a humorous but deep reflection on the differences between high and popular culture. The narrator's description and characterization of Pedro Camacho are not exempt from irony as when the narrator distances the readers from the possibility of really believing that Camacho is a true artist by making him recommend to one of his actors to masturbate before going on air in order to soften his voice and add some passion to his vocal cords, or when he makes Camacho use extremely unusual vocabulary that connote his scripts as slightly 
archaic and old-fashioned. The novel combines chapters about the life of Mario and the fictional soap opera stories in order so that it is very easy for the readers to identify which is which. They are not mixed, um, uh, but the director, the film director in the adaptation, American adaptation, John Emil, does mix them, uh, making the love story between Mario and his aunt become a fictional soap opera story. So this is a very interesting adaptation and a very interesting twist. Uh, one example um, of the way Vargas Llosa delivers the information is the uh, for instance, the way in which we get to know the information about the family background of the protagonist, Mario. We only found out uh, that uh, he lives with his grandparents towards the, the middle of a very long novel. And so he's constantly visiting his family, his relatives, but we don't really know who he, live, uh, he lives with. No? And uh, we don't find out that his parents, his fictional parents, are in, um, in the novel, are uh, in the USA until uh, much later. So this is an example of how um, Vargas Llosa delivers the information uh, to his readers. No? We, we have to uh, find out for ourselves, and information is only provided when needed. No? Um, well, this, uh, this plot more or less resembles the real-life episode of uh, Mario Vargas Llosa with his aunt, uh, Julia, that I, I mentioned at the beginning of, of this talk. Uh, it is narrated in a melodramatic and humorous tone uh, that mimics the uh, soap opera style of Pedro Camacho. For instance, when Mario's family find out about his affair with his much older aunt, his father returns to Peru immediately carrying a gun and threatening to shoot Julia and his own son should they continue their relationship. But the son, instead of separating from Julia, marries her after a crazy search for a mayor who marries them illegally. This novel perfectly fits the famous observation by Mexican uh, writer Carlos Fuentes about another novel written by Vargas Llosa. Um, Carlos Fuentes said regarding the greenhouse that, quotes, once the somber complexities of Mario Vargas Llosa's second novel are shed to their bare bones, they can be boiled down to one of the standard plots of the Mexican cinematic melodrama. And um, I would like to just uh, briefly show uh, a part of, the, um, of, of John Emil's uh, adaptation. Um, oh, yeah. Hey, hey, I see your face. You bought the farm, man. You're finished. You farm. Oh, yeah, bought me. Good. <laughs> I'll be good for something, good. <laughs> my Aunt Julia. I'll call it My Aunt Julia. I think you better change the name. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Depends. Depends. On what? Fish is done. <laughs> okay, you've gone belly up in shit's creek. You need a paddle real bad. What do you reach for? Art! That's what I'm talking about. The very apex of your art. I want to hear your sinews crack and strain. I want your souls to enter those microphones and emerge like ghosts in the homes of our listeners. There's an army of them out there, groping blindly, toiling in the darkness, waiting for what? For you, for your incandescent brilliant, palpitating talent to light up I'm gonna show two more clips. Our attitudes, the so-called feelings yeah, in your stupid heart. Because, from me, um, from us, 
Pedro Camacho is using no his life as part we of the soap uh, opera stories. Art isn't just some guy's name, you know. Art is two cannibals on a desert island. Die in a hunger. Eat or be eaten, Martin. Name of the game. Eat or be eaten. You don't have to say anything, son. You made a simple mistake. Could happen to anybody. I'm used to being misunderstood. And I show you, I have no hard feelings. I bought you and the beautiful Aunt Julia a gift. New and New Club. For tonight? Have a wonderful time, Martin. So a good time. Eat, drink, maybe a little. <laughs> Who knows? Enjoy. Zagosunt. Uh, may I speak to Luke Loder, please? Oh, Mr. Loder? Uh, this is Cynthia, uh, Mr. O'Grady's secretary at WXPU. Uh, congratulations, sir. You have just won two free tickets to New Orleans' most exciting nightclub. <laughs> Carmichael. Oh, boy. Wow. Wow. Yes. To Pedro. <laughs> to Pedro. Just <laughs> cut the run. Come on. Cut the run. <laughs> cut the run. <laughs> Here we see how um, Pedro Camacho interferes in, in uh, the life of, um, of Mario and um, makes him, you know, makes the family realize that he's going out with his aunt. Mm? When, um, it's also very interesting, I, I don't have time to show the end, but the ending of the novel and the film are very different. Um, the film has a happy ending. Pedro Camacho moves to another place and becomes, uh, it is uh, suggested that he becomes a Hollywood director. And um, so he becomes very successful and they, they end up in Paris and there is no divorce and the happy couple uh, continue together. Um, but in the novel, there is a very sad ending. Um, Pedro Camacho has gone mad. He's been in an asylum and uh, He's being helped by a, by a woman who is a whore, and uh, well, it's very uh, dramatic, the ending, no? So it's uh, quite different. Um, 
And um, well, I, I was going to talk about other, but I think uh, I just uh, conclude here. To conclude from what I have shown, it is clear that the written and visual medium are of different nature and function with different, within different industries and employ sometimes different dynamics. Here I have attempted to highlight some of them. The film directors, producers, and script writers who have adapted Vargas Llosa's novels to the audiovisual medium are aware of the need to attract the maximum number of viewers possible to the, uh, cinema theaters. Unlike novels, film need uh, money to be made. Of this difference was very aware the famous Spanish filmmaker Buñuel, who complained about this added difficulty of the filmmaker in contrast to his friends who were poets and painters. The funding, the funding invested in a film, not just its production, but also post-production, distribution, exhibition, marketing, is usually directly proportional to its box office, office, although this is not always the case. The film crew have therefore simplified the plots and guided the viewer much more than Vargas Llosa guides uh, his readers. It is uh, challenging for filmmakers to play with formal characteristics as Vargas Llosa does. Uh, if they wish to sell tickets to as large an audience as possible. These film adaptations are worthy by themselves, but can also serve to introduce the literary text to a larger number of readers, because when we watch the film adaptations based on Vargas Llosa's works, the difficulties to follow the plot in the novels vanish, or seem to vanish partly in the film. And since this is a book fair event, I would still like to ask uh, why read Vargas Llosa in an audiovisual era when we are trained to read visual images better than complex novels. I hope this presentation has provided uh, some answers to these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes, for the inspiring sharing.